So I pivoted from this location-based mm-hmm. business to the military simulation mm-hmm. market. Uh, and I remember vividly coming to the former chief of staff of the U.S. Army with my uh, lasers and alien <laughs> shooting uh, uh, content and telling him, trust me, sir, <laughs> we can we can use this technology to train S- U.S. soldiers. Soldiers trained with doom, huh? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So um, so it was, uh, it was a really interesting time because the simulation market was mm-hmm. obviously pretty established, but it was only for... Uh, you know, flight simulation yep. uh, for tank simulation. Mm-hmm. It was not this organic, uh, mm-hmm. you know, dismounted infantry soldier uh, type of apl- applications. Uh, you only train in the physical realm, yep. uh, not in the virtual when you're uh, when when you're a soldier or special forces. So, uh, so introduce VR to you know to, to 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 that community, and for about ten years, I build uh, the hardware, the software, the middleware, the application mm-hmm. layer. Um, it's actually started by taking uh, a recruitment game called America's Army mm-hmm. and uh, uh, putting America's Army on the entertainment system that I had for the location base mm-hmm. and putting together a show for G4 uh, where we were showing to the audience of the America's Army uh, uh, basically the beginning of what ended up being a training solution mm-hmm. uh, for the U.S. Army. So it was a very interesting time. How did how, how did that at that stage now? Because this is like early two thousands. Yeah, this this was um, two thousand two to two thousand twelve. Okay, also right. also ten year period. This right? is another ten year period. Mm-hmm. So first ten years was location based. Yep. So like I'm thinking of like the Dave and Buster's kind of like you know experiences. Correct. Next ten years. Um, Working with the army, um, how did that? Since, since that is, you know, well, in total now a twenty year span, how did the VR experience change in the from, from then to then? Because I would assume big budgets with the military, probably pretty high production, even though it's now a decade ago. Sure, sure. the the way The way I tackle this is, I really didn't want to. There was no strong expertise. Uh, in the procurement process. Mm-hmm. Um, so the last thing I wanted to do is put myself in a situation where requirements would be predefined for me. Mm-hmm. So it took a completely different approach. I uh, essentially privately funded the development mm-hmm. and got earmarks from uh, uh, Senator Inouye and Senator Akaka, some of the, mm-hmm. the folks that could actually earmark funds into the defense budget for a specific project, mm-hmm. uh, for pilot project uh, deployment, mm-hmm. which gave us the the creativity and the technical um, ability to innovate mm-hmm. and build and define the requirement ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, o- over the course of ten years, I ultimately designed three generations of these systems mm-hmm. uh, with all these different subsystems. And it, you know, and uh, at the tail end of it, these systems looked. Um, I, I'll share some pictures. Yeah. Uh, it, it, super organic, and they were. Uh, 60 gigahertz wireless head mount display, the very mm-hmm. first implementation of a wireless head mount display. So as a as a soldier, you're basically wearing your tactical gears. Yep. Uh, you've got a receiver behind uh, that's 60 gigahertz connected to a PC that's sitting very close to you, uh, but you have full freedom of movement. Mm-hmm. You are wearing essentially rigid bodies uh, instead of a spandex suit yep. for motion tracking. So you've got uh, very rapid inside and outside. Uh, so, so already back then you had haptics? We n- Not haptics. Okay. Uh, uh, basically, the, the well, we actually had a force feedback for the weapon, but mm-hmm. uh, uh, we had rigid body tracking mm-hmm. so that you could track the full body of, full the, of, of, the, of the soldiers. And we would instrument the M4 mm-hmm. with skins on each side of the M4 and a b- number of different sensors. So you could actually use your actual rifle oh, okay. inside the virtual world and aim with six degrees of freedom uh, tracking for the weapon and your head and align this. Wow. Uh, so you, you basically have the same kind of tactile experience that you would if you were in a live training range. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. Uh, so we build these systems, um, uh, you know, all, all of that, that chain of value proposition from leveraging a game engine mm-hmm. and building, you know, the entire hardware, software, middleware content. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and at the end, you could train a squad, which is nine soldiers, or a full platoon, which is 32, mm -hmm. uh, in these completely uh, 10 by 10 uh, training volumes. Mm -hmm. So very similar to what the Vive uh, tracking volume ended up mm. being, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yes. Is what was the intention behind it? Is it that um, is it more cost effective than training in a real scenario? Is it that you can create more scenarios? Is it more that you can have one training facility in one location and train with people in different? Like, what was the main appeal for them to start doing VR? Well, the techniques, tactics, and procedures. Mm -hmm is something that you can rinse and repeat mm -hmm. in a virtual environment. Mm -hmm. The benefit of an after action review uh, and the ability to analyze this from all these different perspectives mm -hmm. is extremely valuable. And so you could really um, use a computer environment, computer mm -hmm. generated environment, uh, to, to go through all of these basic uh, concepts and then you could take the same framework mm. and actually do mission rehearsal. Mm. Uh, so this applies from, you know, the, the basically um, entry level all the way to the special forces mm -hmm. um, because of the range of what you can do in a simulated environment. Right. Yeah, and probably actually reduces risk too. You know, especially in a, when it's with weapons. You know, there's 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 a there's a tons of benefits in mm -hmm. simulation. That's why. <clears throat> That's why simulation is such a big business uh, for, mm -hmm. for all the armed forces. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to earmark a topic for later that I definitely want to discuss, but, but, but first I want to finish the, the history because ultimately I think um, there's probably more and more, you know, already now fewer soldiers are putting boots on the ground and there's already now, you know, people navigating drones from afar, right? Uh, we're probably not that far away from people, you know, let's say navigating cyborgs for, via VR. Not that that's a good thing to look forward to, but I feel like that's probably not that far away. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's, you know, there's definitely a much more complicated and complex uh, infrastructure for urban warfare. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, the, the General Fred Wyan, who was my, my lead investor mm -hmm. uh, in, in this company, was uh, the general who actually led the Vietnam War. Mm. And, um, you know, when I first approached him, uh, he was like telling me, you know, how impactful, of course, that type of training would have been mm -hmm. uh, in the environment that he had fought. So uh, there, there is a huge value proposition in, in being able to do these mission rehearsal and being able to actually know where you're going and how you need to behave and, and right. how you need to protect each other. So, um, uh, the, you know, clearly... Um, uh, that that type of, of training uh, didn't exist mm -hmm. and now is one of the many ways uh, the, the US Army, the National Guard and others are, are training. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes me actually think of, uh, I think it was Ender's Game. I don't know if you've ever yes. read it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. 